my goal one day was to try to understand my behavior when using my computer. And actually, my goal was to understand my behavior. And lucky me, I spend most of my time in front of a computer, so I have a tool that's available most of the time. And so the, the first goal is to understand what I do. And the second goal, which I managed to do somewhat less, was to predict what I'm about to do. Uh, so a couple of examples of this are uh, I might be interested in in knowing, uh, say, when I take a pause, if my pauses are really as short as they as I think they are, answer no. Um, or uh, another thing is sort of like in terms of prediction, can I predict when I'm getting ready to be distracted, when I'm soon to be distracted? It would be really lovely to have sort of the equivalent of one of those things that they have in the United States for car drivers that wake you up when you're about to fall asleep. Um, so, um, so that's sort of the, the, the goal. The caveat is that it's, it's a side project, right? And it's, a, it's not even the, my most important side project. So it's something I use to, to learn about things. It's something that is really fascinating, and I get to do some interesting stuff. And in particular, it gives me a chance to play with technologies, to learn technologies that I don't get to play with at work. Um, but, and I'm, gonna, I'm saying that here just so that you understand that my, my goal in that, and my goal in this talk is to sort of lead you through the, um, I, I want to lead you through the adventure more than I want to show you any particular result that came out of it, because really the result is going to be that, you know, Jeff does this, who cares? But, um, but the, the, the progression of how the, the thinking goes and how, the, how all of this goes is perhaps more interesting and more general. So the first question is, where does the data come from? Well, it comes from my computer, right? But what do I have in my computer that tells me what I'm doing now? And uh, I, I'm, I'm a Linux guy, so there's this concept of active window, um, uh, which, anyway. Um, so I wrote a script that keeps track of the title of the active window. And so once a minute, it, um, while I'm logged in, once a minute, it, uh, it writes down the name of the active window and a timestamp. And then I was chatting with a friend who said, well, why don't you keep the whole window? <laughs> That's an idea. So uh, it turns out that even with my high DPI screen, which has more pixels than I ever imagined, um, I can take a screenshot of it and then reduce it to a 100 by 100 pixel postage stamp without noticing that I've done anything particularly intensive. So that's kind of neat. I'm happy that my computer is, is powerful. So now I have these little postage stamps. Um, and they're, t they're time stamped also. So then the question is, what can I do with all of this? Um, so this is an example of the sort of um, thing that I get, right? Um, is this thing here a laser? Yes. Well, no, but there's three of them, so it doesn't really matter. So, um, so it's a timestamp, and then the name of the window title while I was writing these slides. At, 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 I mean, I just grabbed the, the, the line, the last line at some point while I was writing the slides. <coughs> this is an example of a 100 pixel by 100 pixel uh, image thumbnail. It's, it's, it keeps the, 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 the original aspect ratio. Um, it turns out that even within 100 by 100 pixels, you can get a pretty good idea of, of what's going on. So what was I doing here? Gmail, yeah. Um, what was I doing here? Yeah, more, more particularly, what's the application? It's a, it's a terminal, right? Um, and here? Yeah, Google Docs. Good. Uh, I, love, I love hanging out with geeks, because you recognize exactly which document editor. Um, and, and this one? Exactly. It's, this is an Emacs window. So, um, so quite surprisingly, I now have on my computer the most sensitive data about my personal life that I ever thought I would have. You know, I, I encrypt all my passwords, but this stuff isn't encrypted. And it's, it's kind of sobering in a way. There's been some work on super resolution. And I was hoping to have time to do that as an experiment before this talk. But, uh, but I didn't have that kind of time. And, um, um, the, the idea is that you train a neural net on sort of image thumbnails that are entirely Greeked like this, and it's a supervised context where you give it the original non-reduced window on the side, 
uh, as, the, as, the, as the expected output. And it actually learns to take things like this and reproduce the text that was in it, um, which is really kind of scary. Um, and kind of cool at the same time, right? Um, I didn't have time to check it for mine, and I'm not even sure if I have enough disk space to store all of the full-size windows that I'd need to get a, a decent training set, but it's something I want to try someday. Um, so the first rule of machine learning is not to do machine learning, right? So let's look at the data and see what we can learn from just, just from look, looking at the data. So here, blue is my desktop and red is my laptop. This is time in days, and this is time during the day. I cut out the, um, the, the, the labels here because I was afraid that it would not be visible, though clearly I needn't have had that fear on these screens. But um, so one of the things you can see is when I take holidays. You can see when I took a holiday into to Asia and, uh, and Australia. Um, and, um, uh, and you can see things like I tend to use my desktop during the day and my laptop more in the evening. Right? So, so right away, just visualizing, there's some, things, some interesting things that I can, can learn about myself, even though I might have suspected that without looking at the data. Um, I can also look at my usage during the day, and this is where I discovered that when I think I'm taking a 10-minute pause to get a cup of tea, I'm often taking a half-hour, 45-minute pause to take a cup of tea. Um, so uh, feedback is always a good thing. Um, this is over a slightly longer period of time. And you can see the weekends, right? I mean, this is a day when I wasn't working. Um, and weekends, weekends also tend to have more laptop usage than... Um, than, uh, than weekdays, for example. So you see, the, you see lots of red every seven, uh, on a cycle of seven. Um, so supervised learning is, we're going to say easy, right? Because the next slide says unsupervised. Um, and so I really want to sort of stay in this context of supervised learning. The advantage of unsupervised learning is that the, the Lots of advantages, right? One of the big advantages of unsupervised learning is that labeling is hard and expensive. And that's, that's the case for me also. Um, I have about 300,000 points, 300,000 observations. And labeling those points is tedious as all get out. And being a good computer scientist, computer programmer, I'm lazy. And so I'll go to great lengths with software to try to avoid, um, try to avoid doing manual work. So, I played around with quite a bit of stuff, but um, uh, I'm actually not very good with neural networks. That's not the stuff I do every day of, of every day of my life. So I was sort of trying to leave that part till the end to the, to the extent that I could. And we'll get into exactly how that works. Um, I put in a little bit of sort of basic theory, but I'm pretty sure I don't need it here. So we'll just sort of skip over that. The, um, the general strategy here is that I first want to look for features, figure out what sort of features are interesting, then label those features, and then I want to auto-label the rest of the features, right? I want to come up with some technique so that I can label a few of the points and then have the, have the computer go and suggest a label for the rest. And then I just sort of have to reality check that a little bit. And then I, and then I want to form sequences of things. And then finally, what I'd love to do is, is actually predict something. So everyone's heard of bag of words? Has anybody not heard of bag of words? Excellent. OK, just a couple. Um, we'll go through it in about 10 seconds, just for the couple people who said no. But um, uh, so the, the strategy is that I want to use bag of words. And then I want to use TFIDF. Anybody not know TFIDF? I don't mean to single people out. I'm just the, the, the negative is the more interesting number right now. Thanks. Um, it's term frequency inverse document frequency. The idea is that I want to look at the words that show up often, but I want to weight less the words that show up in lots of different documents. Here, each line, each window title is, is a document. Right? So, so if a word shows up in lots of window titles, in some sense, it doesn't carry as much meaning as something that shows up in just a few of them. I'm not entirely sure that that's completely useful for me because, for example, Emacs shows up in a lot of window titles. And it actually is significant because it says that I'm developing well, most of the time. Um, and I also was playing with Word2Vec to see if that could help me a little bit. 
And then the strategy is to find a sequence based on this stuff. So um, this is the 10 second introduction to set bag of words for those who haven't seen it. You take some words, you number them because computers deal with numbers. Uh, then you forget the words and you just remember the numbers and then you say, well, actually I want to know the position of these things. So, so one is one and six is six and so forth. And, um, and then that's called a one-hot encoding. And uh, so our original sentence translates to that as a one-hot encoding. And it's called bag of words because we just collect the set of words that are in the, in the document and forget about the order. Um, good, that's the fastest bag of words explanation you'll ever hear. Um, and, um, and then let me talk a little bit about images, because that's the other piece of this, is sort of what do I, um, I thought I had one more slide about this. I'm pretty sure I have another slide about, um, about the text part, but apparently I misplaced it after this bit about images, so let me just say what I was going to say. Um, the, um, when I started playing with this and looking at the, looking at the data, what I discovered was that um, I really needed to label more data. And labeling the data turns out to be um, painstakingly boring. I don't have the option of you know, hiring somebody to do it for me or something like that, right? I have to sit there and so I wrote a little program that just shows these things to me one at a time and, and lets me choose from the, the categories I've got. Um, so my data ended up being dirtier than I would have liked, and same with the results. So I can't actually tell you whether TFIDF or word to vec worked better for giving me, um, for giving me a, um, uh, a decent sequence of labels, because both of them were dirty enough that, um, that it was clear that my first step really should be cleaning up the, adding more labels and cleaning up the labeling so that I had a better strategy. The idea for auto-labeling was simply to do a nearest neighbor assignment, right? So every point that doesn't have a label on it, we say, well, what are the labeled points that you're closest to? And as long as you're sort of closest to only one guy, then say, okay, that's gonna be your label. And then where can I go from there? Uh, and as I said, it turns out I just need to label more points to get really clean data. So I don't feel comfortable saying which technique worked better or what sort of technique I should use in the future because it's clear what my first step of optimi optimizing this should be. Um, the other thing that, that this brought up is um, that, so some of you who are, say, like my age, will remember 15 years ago when uh, somebody would be talking about a home project and he would reveal that he hadn't been using source code control on his home project. Now with GitHub, they've gamified it, and I want to make that little brown square darker. So I, I, I commit many times a day if I can. But, um, but, but there's always this temptation when you're doing a side project at home not to use the sort of formal techniques. So OK, I did use Git for this stuff, and, and I threw stuff away, and I rewrote stuff and all that. But um, one of the things I didn't do was to, when I got bad results, I didn't write down just how bad the results were, because I knew they were bad, and I knew, knew I needed to repeat them. And of course, if I'd been at work, I would have kept these nice plots so that when my boss comes along and says, you know, what the heck, you're, you know, you're not only here, I could say, yeah, but it used to be here. And that's, that's always nice to show. So it's sort of a reminder that, um, that even on home projects and personal projects, it's nice to keep, um, uh, nice to keep a, a good, solid um, technique. Um, Ian Oswald, is he here? No. So anyway, you probably all know Ian. So he wrote this neat, uh, uh, notes for himself about uh, how to do data, data science. And it's, it's worth reading once in a while because it reminds me of things like this. Um, in this particular case, I was preparing this talk when I said it would have been really nice to have, have this sequence of how it improved over time, but I don't have that, sorry. So with images, um, I'm gonna jump through this because you've, you've all seen MNIST and, uh, and you've probably already recognized this as, as the classic MNIST uh, data, right? So. Um, I threw this in because I wasn't at all sure what the um, um, what the level of um, um, what the level of people here would be. So um, so anyway, so remember we were talking about bag of words, word to vec. Um, so word to vec. Oh yeah, that's the reason I put that there. Was word to vec? The idea is that you train this very simple neural network to do basically dimensionality reduction, which gives you this uh, lower dimensional space. The problem with um, 
the, the problem with doing any sort of nearest neighbor assignment when you're in a very high dimensional space is that there's a lot of space in a high dimensional space. Um, this is an interesting point of theory. Does everybody know the curse of dimensionality? Anybody not? Um, let me phrase it another way. If there were a, a smart 10-year-old next to me and who said, what's the curse of dimensionality? Could you explain it in a way that the 10-year-old can understand? Who could, thinks they could do that? OK, so let me go through a quick, um, a quick tiny bit on the curse of dimensionality here just to sort of highlight why it is I believe that um, I want to reduce dimensions. There's a lot of space in big spaces. So if I take a unit cube in n-dimensional space, it has volume one, right? If I make that unit cube be one plus epsilon on each side, right? As n goes to, as n increases without bound, the volume of that cube also increases without bound, even though I've increased it only by epsilon. And same thing if I decrease it by epsilon, the volume of the cube goes to zero, right? Which means that any, any cubic subset of, of a unit cube in n-dimensional space has arbitrarily small dimension, which is just really weird. Um, another way of thinking of this space problem, well, two other ways of thinking of the space problem is to think of the longest diagonal. So my sack of words space, the, 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 the space with the one hot encoding, has dimension about 50,000. Right? So that means the longest diagonal in that space in a unit cube is the square root of 50,000. Right? So there's, there's just a lot of space in that space. So doing a nearest neighbor encoding, the risk is that, that sort of everything is too far away from everything else. And so you lose some sort of context of, of neighborliness. Um, one other way of thinking of it is if you think of the number of quartants in a unit cube of n dimensions, there's two to the n of them. And so that leaves a lot of places for everybody to be on his own. Um, so this is a nearly useless graphic, but, but it's kind of fun. This is the machine that the word to vec guys used, Mikhailov and guys used to, um, to compute their thing. And you've probably all seen this because had I known that uh, Lev was going to present twice on GenSim and explain this stuff, I wouldn't have needed to, to do this. Um, it gets tiresome to quote Google all the time, so here's list. Um, I, tried projecting the entire space. So I took this, took my 50,000 dimensional space and projected it to two dimensions. Um, realistically, I should have used TSNE to do this. Um, I used this projection whose name I can never remember that just happens to be in scikit-learn. Um, and, and it doesn't matter, right? Because the, the only goal was to see, does it show up in a bunch of blobs? And the answer is, it, it doesn't. There's some latent structure. Um, I took one of the nearest neighbor encodings, and you know it's nice to see that they all sort of project together, but it, it's, it's not very meaningful. Um, but it's nice to draw pictures of your data, even if you don't think you're going to learn too much from that particular picture. What would have been fascinating is if I'd seen more things like this, right? If I'd seen you know, one of these here, and one of these here, and one of these here. Um, in fact, it's not entirely clear that you know, there's this big swath here, and I don't yet know what it is. Um, it occurred to me when I was watching um, Guillaume's talk this morning, he had a graphic something like this, and um, I'm, I'm colorblind, so I always forget to put color in my slides because I, <laughs> uh, I just forget. And um, it occurred to me that I might have done something where I showed quite a few of the clusters that I found and projected them to this thing. But the problem is those pictures aren't meaningful to me because I can see about three or four colors at a time before it starts to all blend together. And um, so I don't think of that until there's somebody around looking at it who reminds me. But um, anyway, um, good. So this is the sort of sequence that I get. Um, Jellybooks is my company, so my, you know, I'm doing Jellybooks development, and then I check something on Stack Overflow, and clearly I'm you know, trying to figure something out, and then I'm doing more development. Um, so that's the sort of sequence I'm looking for, is, is what am I doing? Um, and that's the sort of stuff that I get. One of the things that I didn't anticipate when I started the project is that there are, um, there are things where I look at it, and I, I know what I was doing, but I have no idea how to tag it. I don't know what to call that particular thing. And I started coming up with names like life. But um, 
but I'm not sure that that's going to be a very useful or, or, or predictive type of label, but it's, sometimes it's the only one I could come up with. Um, so now in terms, of, in terms of images, we have exactly the same, the, same, um, uh, the, the same sequence of things we want to do, right? We want to come up with features. We want to label them. We want to go on to auto-labeling and come up with some sequences of labels, right? And eventually predict. So the first strat part of this is, lab is labeling. And I did exactly the same thing as I did with the, uh, with the, the window titles, right? I just wrote a little program that showed these things to me one at a time, enormously magnified so I could see it. And then I would just type what I thought I was doing. And um, to be fair, I, um, oh, this is a piece of, uh, one of Google's um, machines, which I didn't really want to go into. Um, let me go back. <coughs> so to, to be fair, I wanted to start with the, the sort of the simplest thing I could possibly start with. So for features, I simply took color histograms of, of each of the images. And it turns out that that's not an entirely dumb thing to do because, for example, Emacs window, well, terminal windows are almost all black and white, uh, well, with gray. Emacs, there's some syntax coloring. Any website, it turns out that their branding gives them some very unique color signatures. So it turns out that I can do something sort of reasonable with that. Um, the, um, the next thing that I want to do with that, besides clean up my data, but as I pointed out, I'm sort of constantly procrastinating on that because that's the least fun part of the project, um, is there are, so this thing is, uh, these two things are pieces of the machine from the 2012 Google paper where they recognized cats in, in YouTube videos. Um, that's the cat that they recognized. Um, they, um, and we also, in 2012, we all sort of thought that, that this was amazing, that they had this nine-layer uh, neural network. But since then, the visual geometry group at somewhere uh, came up with a, 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 a neural network that they called VGG16 because it has 16 layers. And then shortly after that, VGG19 uh, because it has 19 hidden layers. And, um, and they published and they, they made available the, the trained model for free. And then Microsoft, I think it was, did ResNet, which is a 50-layer um, neural network. So, we're, so this is great, because these people are publishing the trained models, which saves us a lot of time. If you put an image into this model, what comes out, the, 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 the exit neurons are things like, this is a cow, or this is a kangaroo, or this is a dog. Um, and I'm pretty sure that I don't have that in my images. But if I look at the layer one under this, and I, now I'm talking about things that I haven't done, but I would like to do. If I look at the, the n minus 1 layer, in principle, it's recognized most of the sort of interesting features without abstracting that to what those features are. And it should give me a pre-trained model that will give me some interesting feature vectors, right? Because I can look at which features of, the, of that n minus 1 layer have lit up. And, um, and then I can explore. Uh, maybe I need to look at n minus 2 or something like that. But it's, it's a way of generating synthetic features. And it's sort of a hack, but it's a hack that seems like it ought to work, because we all sort of know how these convolutional networks sort of build things up by, by shape. Um, sequences. So the sequences here look a little bit different, though, right? because I thought it would be cheating to say that's an Emacs window, and I know what I was editing was. Um, so I just said it's an Emacs window, or it's a terminal, or something like that. So the same sequence before looked something like this when it came to, uh, when it came to the actual window thumbnails. Now, in terms of prediction, um, this is a piece of the, the project that is, is, has uh, forever been on the to-do list, because I haven't quite gotten. I'm, I'm not too interested in predicting if I don't believe that I'm labeling, auto-labeling correctly. Um, but, um, or, or with reasonably good accuracy. So the idea with predicting is that I take a sequence of things, so it's still supervised learning, I take a sequence of, of things that have happened, and then I take the sequence of things that happen right after, and that's what I give to the, 
to the um, classifier, and I say, I say, hey, here's your input, here's your output, and then I start trying to get it to predict on, on, on you know, on the testing set where I don't give it the um, output. Um, my plan for this, and those of you, if those of you in here who know neural networks better than I can can offer me feedback on it, but my plan for this was just to use like a simple multi-layer perceptron to see what I could do with a fixed window size. Um, because again, I, I always think that I should start with the sort of simplest thing I can and then we'll go from there. Um, the code, and I need to push and, and merge a, a branch before this will actually look right, but um, the code is here if you want to look at it. For reasons that seemed logical at the time but no longer make any sense at all, I did not use pandas for this project. I used um, well, some other nice features in Python. Uh, I would be astonished if anybody really got into this enough to want to submit pull requests for my personal project. But then a year ago, I might have been astonished at the idea that over 100 people would be sitting here listening to me tell you about my personal project. So um, if if you look at this and you get frustrated that it's not pandas, I would accept such a pull request. It's just, you know, not something I've gotten around to doing. And with that, any questions? Any questions? Anyone? Cool. Well, I actually have one. Um, have you look, tried looking at... Um, Recurrent neural networks for sort of predicting from there, so they're sort of well optimized. for the sequence prediction. The part. sequence because they're well optimized for a sequence. Prediction. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I thought about it, and um, and then it, it really came down to sort of the a friend of mine said, well, you know, an, uh, a multi-layer perceptron is going to be easier and simpler. You might try that first. And I thought, yeah, it is a bit simpler. I even understand MLPs a little bit better than I understand recurrent networks. So maybe I'll try that first. But yeah, a recurrent network would be a good idea. I, I thought about using an LSTM, and I was roundly told I was crazy. Because, so the idea with LSTMs is that maybe you can, you can understand history without specifying a window size. And I was roundly told that I was getting too complicated, and I should drop that idea. So, yeah. So apart from taking shorter breaks now. Did you learn anything from it? <laughs> Did you change anything in your behavior? Most of what I learned is about, is about data science and about the, the algorithms I'm playing with. Because most of them, like you know, word to vec for example, is something that I'd read the papers, but until I actually started playing with it, I, you know, like I understand it very differently once I start to play with it. Um, so. It's good to help Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's good to have a reason to be doing these things in order to do them. Um, I suspect that the, the most fascinating thing I could possibly learn is if I could manage to predict when I'm going to get distracted and warn me against that. I suspect that this is something I will un, I'll be unlikely to predict accurately. Um, because if I build a predictor and it's, say, 90% accurate, that means 10% of the time I'm going to distract myself by telling me I'm about to be distracted, and that would probably be worse. So the chances of my getting something running accurately enough to run on my machine so it pops up something that says, wake up, Jeff. It seems small, but yeah. I'd love to figure out a periodicity for it, though. Is there a question? Yeah. Hi. Th thanks, sir. It was really interesting. Like you said, the journey is sometimes more interesting than the <laughs> result. Um, did you, could you say something about your experiences around hitting performance issues and what you did about it <coughs> and what you learned. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, I very quickly came, came up with a performance issue just on loading and saving the data set. Um, and my solution was to suck it up and say, I don't want to spend the development time to switch to a proper database. I'm just going to continue doing a full load and save every time. Um, um, the, I was actually astonished at how fast most of these things run. Now, I have an 8-core i7 machine here, right? So it's, um, it's four times two for hardware people, but it's, it's an 8-something i7. And, um, and I'm a, I was astonished at how fast these things ran. I, I didn't really have to wait for anything besides the data to actually load from the 
is about, I was running about 18 seconds for the data to actually load into the program on each run. Sorry, so I, I sometimes have fun in, in doing personal projects. And the, I find that some of the harder problems to solve are when you hit memory issues rather than kind of CPU kinds of issues. Did you come across anything like that? I didn't. Um, but then I did some back of the envelope calculations and said, well, um, the, you know, my feature vectors are, um, my, my, my feature vectors are, you know, okay, there are 50,000 in the case of the, of the one hot encoded window titles, but I'm only doing computations based on the training set, which is what I've labeled. So since I haven't labeled 50,000 things or 100,000 things, I don't actually have to train on that. Um, for, the, for the images, since I'd reduced to playing with color histograms, again, I had 700 and what's 250, 256 times three, seven, um, well, whatever, 700 and something. Um, so I have you know, the 700 and something long uh, vectors of, of data about each window. And again, it didn't, it didn't turn into anything that was overly complex for my machine. Um, if I tried to do something where I was processing all of the data at once with maybe only a 20% holdout for testing because I really believed that my auto-labeling is working, um, then I could imagine I might have had that problem. But I tended to, to stay with a much smaller data size. Um, actually, there, there was one time where I was playing with something where I, it was taking too long, and I just started taking random samples of the, of the data set so that I was, it was smaller. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, this is, any more questions? There's one up front. One up front. He's been smiling through the whole talk, so I want to know what he has to say. <laughs> <laughs> you thought about recording your camera and do something with that, like analyzing your facial expression. <coughs> Oh, man. Um, yeah, and I should keep track of GDB state when I'm doing that, too, just so I could see if there's a correlation. Um, I, I haven't. Uh, that would be kind of fascinating. Um, I was curious, also, if I, if I could get it to the point where I could sort of identify when I was having video chats with people who I was chatting with. But I, that was a refinement I never got to. Any other questions? Cool. Well, I think I deserve another round of applause. So, okay, thank you.